Robots are taking over many business processes. We have an expert to explain how. Plus, we'll explore the growing use of artificial intelligence. This is 7 Day Yield. Welcome to 7 Day Yield. I'm Lydia Morish. And I'm Mitch Rochelle. More and more we hear about robots playing a role in business processes. Turns out they're not R2-D2. Lydia recently caught up with PwC's robotic process automation leader to explore this growing trend. So Kevin, AI we've heard a lot about. Digital labor, what is it and what makes it so compelling? Sure, so digital labor refers to an evolving ecosystem of technologies that automate how humans deal with machines and with software. Among that is RPA and intelligent process automation. RPA is robotic process automation. It automates tasks such as different screen clicks, different con paste between applications. And the impact is the ability to uh, generate a lot of productivity uh, with uh, existing software packages. Intelligent process automation is a new, uh, fast emerging class of tools that complements RPA. There may be elements of judgment or decisions or other things that you're doing that may not be as easy to define. Mm -hmm. Intelligent automation is, is taking artificial intelligence and machine learning concepts and trying to drive what those decisions are on top of that technology. So not only can you start to automate the known, you can start to automate the unknown. Right. So if we look at it as a scale, right, and you have full manual labor on one side and then the intelligent process automation on the other. RPA seems to fall right in the middle. So within that convergence, where do we see most businesses today and sort of what industries are, are adopting this technology and are going to be most successful? Sure. So I think you know as we look back over the past five to 10 years and look at the topic of productivity, what we've seen is that a lot of organizations have focused on a couple of levers to, to really drive that. The biggest ones being, where do you execute the work? Who executes the work? And how efficiently can you execute the work? Mm -hmm. A lot of those levers, when we talk to our clients, have reached a point of diminishing returns. So that's really driving this kind of next wave of automation, which is really where RPA comes into the picture. Um, RPA is a technology that is fairly uh, simple and easy for clients to get their, their heads around. And so a lot of investment being driven right now is trying to stamp programs around RPA. Mm -hmm. the intelligent automation is probably more of a long-term game changer and has a lot more profound impacts in the future. Right. I would characterize that as something that a lot of our clients are looking at at an early stage kind of research and development type construct. I think the other important part in this, this journey is that as you start to stand up some of these technologies, you introduce all sorts of other questions into the mix in terms of how do I deal with the risk of robots? You know, you know, is there such a thing as a rogue robot and what does that mean? Is the robot eventually gonna take over my job? Um, but looking at it from more a philosophical lens, you know, what is the long-term implication or impact on the workforce? And especially when you look at people that have been doing some of these jobs that are a bit more labor intensive, you know, what, what happens to those people? The ultimate impact, at least in our view, I think is a workforce that is much more highly analytical, much less focused on pure operational commoditized tasks. Um, and likely, in all honesty, probably smaller. You could really see kind of this convergence over the next 10 years of uh, you know, a traditional technology career path, a traditional finance or operations career path, and a traditional kind of analysis path kind of all converging into one. And you're really gonna require someone who's got kind of multidisciplinary skills. So I think that that's one big implication. I think the second big um, question that sits behind that, which you know, I don't think there's a clear consensus in view, is that you are going to free up a lot of capacity. Um, so you start to ask questions around what new capabilities, what new products and services, what are other things that will be generated off the fact that it doesn't cost as much to run something now. So mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that you have to kind of look at on the, the positive, you know, long-term kind of forward-looking side. So on the next episode, we'll be writing our how-to manual, how to work with robots. Exactly. <laughs> Steve, thanks for joining us Thank again you. today. So the, the last thing that we touched upon with Kevin was sort of the philosophical component of this, right? You have some industries that um, we're seeing a lot more of robotic process automation. Is that going to be more prevalent in labor-intensive industries, or is this sort of across the board? I think it's across the board. And... RPA has been around for a decade now, so we're starting to see it impact different industries in different ways. But 
it's not just if it's manually intensive, but if it's repetitive and something needs to be standardized and done in the same way, and it doesn't require a lot of flexibility around how you respond to it, these things all lend themselves to RPA. So there's a lot of different spaces and a lot of different industries where this, this impacts. Mm -hmm. One of the places where we hear a lot of, I guess, aspirational hope that RPA can help is in customer service interactions, which as a customer that scares me, but financial services companies, lodging industries, you know, the travel industry, where they have big call centers, they're trying to figure out if they can cut down the call time by RPA. Are we seeing that uh, trend around the globe? Or, and, and also it's aspirational is the question, is that really ever going to happen? Yeah, less so from a robotic process automation perspective, but more with the AI, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. Right. If you're a bank customer and you have a complex transaction to execute, you're going to call a relationship manager and then he or she will go back into the bank and figure out how to do it. What the bank's interested in is how do I create something that can repeat the way that we do these things in an automated way. So it's less about talking to a robot, but it's more about the, the bank allowing itself to give you an answer that makes sense for you, if you see what I mean. So actually, for, from a customer perspective, having a more consistent answer to something and knowing that you're going to get that quickly is probably a better thing. Well, you touched on AI, and that's actually where we're heading. So if you'll stay with us. From chatbots to robots, artificial intelligence is no longer viewed as primarily a corporate tool to increase automation, but instead it's quickly emerging as a technology that can handle a multitude of global challenges. I recently sat down with PwC's Anand Rao for a deeper dive into AI. Take a listen. It's really easy to think about artificial intelligence in the context of robots and you think of the movie. But perhaps you could provide some background as to the role of AI within financial services. I would say the AI is being used in four main areas within financial services. So one, what people call as robotic process automation, where some of the processes for mortgage processing or insurance processing are being done more automatically now. The second area is what's called as natural language processing, essentially taking any kind of a text document that you have and then trying to extract the meaning out of it. So it may be regulations, it may be various contracts. The third area I would say is machine learning and deep learning, where there's lots of data, transactional data that financial service companies have, and you can take that data and train systems on very specific things, all based around machine learning and deep learning. And lastly, the area that's sort of gaining a lot of traction is voice interfaces. Mm -hmm. And using that for various fraud detection, for anti-money laundering, and various other types of risk-based analytics as well. So you're seeing more and more of AI uh, pervade into the various aspects of what financial services do. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things you mentioned, I'm hearing benefit after benefit. What are some of the risks associated with AI? How do we make sure that the AI is not biased in any way? How can we create AI that can explain itself to a customer service rep or to an end consumer as to why it took a certain decision and mm -hmm. that there is no bias inbuilt into it? So how do you test the data? How do you make sure that the AI that you are building uh, has been properly vetted, properly trained, as they call right. it, uh, and therefore can be used? Uh, in, in a proper way. Mm -hmm. So is AI meant to be a replacement to humans or in some of these cases, as you said, trying to avoid having a bias, can the human actually play a role in counteracting any decision the AI may make? Yeah, I would see AI as playing both of those roles. So there are some tasks that we do in financial services which is very routine, repeatable, mm -hmm. manual. Uh, there's an economic benefit to automating some of those. While that's important, we should also look at working with AI, where the AI is learning from all the data and from the humans. And because it's learned, it is informing us of certain decisions where mm -hmm. the humans can act based on the advice given by the machines. And in turn, they become smarter as we become smarter. So there's this co-evolution mm -hmm. of humans with the, the AI. So the robots uh, will take over. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll both be together, I would say, rather than one taking over the other. Mm -hmm. So just one final thought, you know, we touched on the risks earlier, but if we look at the regulatory component, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me is driverless cars, right? And if a driverless car gets into an accident, then where does the blame lie? 
So if we look at AI in the context of financial services and how quickly the technology is improving, is regulation keeping pace with that? By necessity, always the regulation would be lagging behind the technology and also the adoption. So right. socially or society-wise, what, whatever the people mm -hmm. want, that's what the regulators will come and institute. Welcome back, and Steve, we still have Steve Davies with us. We were talking uh, during that package about machine learning and uh, AI and whether or not those are interchangeable terms, and you said something that was fascinating, so I figured I'd love to have you share it with the audience. Yeah, I think this, this concept of artificial intelligence, it's being worked on, and it's definitely coming, but it's not there yet. So this, that's machines intuitively reacting in almost like a conscious way to what they see in front of them. We talk about AI as really machine learning and cognitive intuition. So you're looking at data, you're reading things, you're listening to things, and you're making choices based on a, a preconceived uh, view of, of what those choices might be. So it's, it's not quite as we would respond, but it's near enough. But the example I was giving when we were talking before was my cable box in my kitchen wasn't working, and when I called customer service for the cable company, once I put my information in, they told me that fact, and they told me that they were, they were asking my permission to ship me a new one. Is that a textbook example of machine learning where you're taking the data from all these different places and giving it to the customer and trying to improve the customer experience? I think that's right. And the companies that we interact with, they have loads of data on us. And particularly in financial services, there's a real need for customers, for, for banks, insurance companies, to, to do more with that data and tell us what you tell us what we should be doing and how we should think about that. And it's, it's looking at that data and reacting to that that they struggle with because there's just so much of it. So machine learning, cognitive, intuitive uh, algorithms that can understand and analyze that data is a better way for these organizations to respond to us. So that's exactly what they did in that, in that example. Well, it sounds, I mean, in that particular instance, it's obviously improving the customer experience. And there's a lot of positives around moving to RPA and, and artificial intelligence. But what is the governance component of this? Because I, I mean, I've done my own research and I was at a conference a couple of years ago and I was personally shocked by how many developments there have been in AI. And, you know, I mean, it, you, I automatically think like, okay, the robot's going to be smarter than me and take over from me. So, you know, how do we sort of control that? It's difficult, isn't it? I mean, there, there's an underlying ethical question about mm -hmm. work and the future of work. But when you look back over history, I mean, I'm an optimist, so I would say that actually there's always roles for humans to play, and we, and we just evolve into that. So things that we might do today, we don't need to do in future. In one case, we were working with an insurance company, and they were worried about um, how this would impact their brokers. And actually, when the brokers looked at what was being offered, they said, this helps to release us from all the admin of what we do and focus on what we're really good at. So there are lots of positives around it. But the broader governance topic is a really interesting one. And how, how do we respond? How do we evolve? And how does policy and regulation respond to these, these developments? Because what the construct that we have wasn't built and designed to address you know, where all this technology is going mm -hmm. to go. Interesting. So many questions you ask. We don't have time to get them all answered. So guess what? We're going to bring you back. We're going to fly you over and bring you back. So. Fantastic. Look Thanks forward. very much, Steve. Uh, Lydia, awesome job on those two interviews. So we're going to keep you as well. Oh, okay. good, right. good news. <laughs> <laughs> and stepping on my line, Lydia, and thank you all for watching. And be sure to check out our PwC YouTube page for all the latest episodes. And assuming we haven't been taken over by robots, we'll see you next time on 7 Day Yield. Are we going to do the robot thing? We didn't yeah. do that well. Now we're not doing that. <laughs>